justified to say take charity and to take loans and not pay them back or to steal and not pay it back than to work for somebody who you owe and pay off your debt honorably in exchange for room and board. There's this thing that people who've served in prison have, have paid their debt to society. That's nonsense. All they've done is added, you know, sucked more resources from society for their upkeep, for their air conditioning and food and cable TV. You know, if it was possible, it would be much better to put people to work to pay off their debts. Yeah, I, I, there's a lot to talk. That's a whole meaty subject. Um, you know, debts. To, let's let's do them one at a time. Which one do you want to do? The criminal is the debtor or the pauper? Whatever you want to take. All right, let's start with the, with the debtor. Right? We're debtors today are mostly what? They're they're you know, people run up their credit cards, whatever. Right? So let's say you have a bank, you have Bank of America, and a person ran up the credit card and they can't pay it, so they default on their credit card. Or, or you know what the one is today is the mortgage. The mortgage is. Right? Okay, let's do a mortgage. I think that's more common today. Mm -hmm. People buy like a million dollar home and they can't pay. They pay like uh, $20,000 into this home and then they go belly up. And mm -hmm. The bank takes back the home. This, the bank actually gets their money back because they can sell the home, right? So there's really no, they didn't lose anything. No, they lose. Banks don't want to take back homes because the transaction costs, when you don't have someone living in a home, it degrades in value. It's, it's a nightmare. Banks do not want to take back property. They only do it when they absolutely have to, when a person defaults. Oh, the really? bank takes a loss when they have to take back the home. So, man, it's easier to do with the muscle of the credit card because the credit card, the, guy, uh, the, the, the bank has already spent all this money mm -hmm. and they're not getting anything back from, right. from, the, from the guy. So, in theory, according to the Torah, what in theory, like, you know, the, the, the person like, who owes the $5,000 on the credit card, so they would go to work for that person. So, so they would be in, they'd go to work for the bank. You know, like, I'm sure the mm -hmm. bank would just love the guy can't handle his finances to get behind the counter and be the teller of the bank. But they'd sweep out the okay, street, so they'd, and they'd clean the windows, right. and they'd mop the floors, and they'd clean the bathrooms. Right, right. They so, wouldn't get anywhere near the money. Okay, so they don't get. So they would do all this like crap work for mm -hmm. them, right? So that's the Torah way. The Torah way says, you know what? You go help Bank of America. You know, you go sweep and clean their johns for until you worked off this five thousand dollars. That's that's the Torah way of doing it, right? Then what's the next one? Was the the criminal? Okay, so the criminal, the way it works in terror is like this. If I steal from you, if I steal your sunglasses, how much are they worth? Ten dollars. Wow. <laughs> I steal your sunglasses, I have ten dollars, and then I sold them or whatever, and then I spent the money on crack. Mm -hmm. I didn't listen to you at the end where you say it's right. the crap, right? And uh, Torah says, I now owe you ten dollars, Plus, I owe you another ten dollars because I owe you double. That's what the Torah mm -hmm. says. I owe you mm -hmm. double. It's called kafel, kafel, mm -hmm. right? So I owe you two sets of sunglasses. That's twenty dollars, but I don't have it. So then I said, Torah says, okay, you go to work for this guy, right? So now I have to like you know clean your john here, you know, and how, you know how much you're gonna pay me, like you know, six, cook my food, cook your food, six bucks an hour. It's gonna have to work for, for a day, yeah. <laughs> and that's the way that one works. That's makes more sense to me than like sending them to prison like you said it's just uh, stupid but that's a whole subject for another time but I, prisons are really not a Torah idea you know there's no place in the Torah where, the, where, where it says to have prisons the only time we see a prison is in Egypt when they threw Joseph in one. Oh yeah that's a goyish concept from the get-go the Torah has no concept of prison all things are money you know monetary fines right such mm -hmm. as what we just discussed, uh, beating, slashings, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, lashes. Lashes, or death penalty. Those are the only types of, pe that's the only thing that Torah knows. Those, the, those three things are the punishments for all crimes. There's no concept of prison, jail, doesn't exist. Hmm. Um, and what was the last one you said? Welfare, if you're pa pauper. indigent. Oh, uh... You can't feed yourself, you don't have anywhere to live. So this would give you a way to make a money, you could make get a job. You can get a job, you can get room and board. What's wrong with that? I think it's a compelling system. Yeah. Uh, okay, go ahead. So instead of welfare, bankruptcy, and prison as we have today, the Torah, 3,200 years ago, has a system of indentured servitude. Now, there are very strict rules about how you can treat your servant. For instance, if there's oh, only yeah. one pillow, 
you have to give the pillow to your servant. So the Talmud developed this very famous saying, right. when you take on a servant, you've taken on a master. Exactly. Because there are all sorts of rules about how you can must treat the person. If, say, you get angry and you knock the person's tooth out, remember, they didn't have sophisticated dentistry back then, teeth fell out pretty easily. So you knock someone's tooth out, you have to let, let the servant go free. Now, if the servant runs away, he cannot be forcibly returned to his master. So there's absolutely nothing in common between the Torah system of so-called slavery, which is really indentured servitude, and what the blacks suffered in the United States. First no, of all, I, I hate that kidnapping. Parallel. There's no kidnapping allowed in the Torah. Kidnapping is a capital offense in Torah. You can't go to right. a country and kidnap people. And then also, if a slave ran away, he cannot be forcibly returned to his master. So there's no comparison. The There's no comparison system. because the whole thing's stupid. And I'll tell you what, it, it really pisses me off when people go, Oh, well, the Bible says that you're allowed to have slaves. So, you know. no, it's that, and you know what, the people in the South, you know, I watched that PBS show we mm -hmm. talked about Religion that. Religion in America. And, 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 the, and, the, and the people in the South who were the slave owners, they pointed to the Bible as their justification. They said, if you have a problem with slavery, then you have a problem with the Bible. That's what they said to the religious people in the North. And it was like, the um, the pastors and the bishops or whatever the hell you know the the the, mm -hmm. the church clergy yeah. were the ones who were arguing against the north clergy and going you can't say that this is human rights violation because then you're saying that God is guilty of it right and I just wanted to like scream during all of this because it's got nothing to do with it it's a terrible translation it's not slave it's uh, in, in indentured servants, yeah. right? And after they freed the slaves with the, with the Emancipation Proclamation in like mm -hmm. 1865 or whatever it was, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those slaves became indentured servants because they didn't have anything else. They didn't know how to make a parnasa, right? And they were just held on, but they were paid for their work. Mm -hmm. They basically, you know, they were treated a little better, but a lot of them became indentured servants. You know about that, right? Yes. And at that point, you could draw a parallel between Judaism and that. But they were free, okay? They were free, you know, whatever. I hate that, that parallel, because it's a terrible translation. So I always end that at the... You, you know, I cut that off at the pass. Because I can't, I can't. It, it just, ugh, makes my head want to explode. Okay, go ahead. So the Torah brought the idea of one morally demanding God into the world, a God who created the universe and right. who is actively involved in human history. So Judaism and the Torah, revolutionary in its theology, but evolutionary in its ethics. It doesn't just say, oh, you can't have servants, or you must, must let all your servants go free. It deals with the reality of the time that it was in. So the Torah does give you great principles, such as love your neighbor as yourself, uh, the Ten Commandments, but it also follows up there with very specific examples. So I have no problem when people give broad generalizations, but you always need to back it out with specific examples so that you can get your hands on what's going on. So. It's easy to give a code for ritual behavior, such as you must pray three times a day, this is what you're allowed to eat, and this is what you must wear. It's very hard to give an ethical code. For instance, let's say you go to a party, and there's someone there who's a loser, who's fat and ugly and got pimples, and no one wants to talk to the person. How much time do you need to spend with that person to fulfill your ethical obligations? If you just say, hi, how are you? Have you fulfilled your obligations? Do you need to spend two minutes talking to the person? Do you need to spend two hours talking to the person? How many cars do you need to let go in front of you who you know, want to merge into, into your lane before <laughs> you know, you've fulfilled your ethical obligations? It's endless. You can't really codify ethics with the same ease you can codify rituals. What the Torah does is it gives some examples, practical examples of how you, you act in real life, and then we can then develop more sophisticated ethical uh, laws and precepts and teachings from these very specific laws of the Torah. So, the Torah is unique in many ways as opposed to other Near Eastern law codes that came about 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Among the ways that it's unique is the way it, all its rules about dealing with servants or so-called slaves. Another way is that the wife is entitled to sexual satisfaction, gratification. There's nothing like that in the other law codes. Kidnapping, f forbidden. If you kill your slave, you are put to death. So there's no Near Eastern parallel to this. So the bond servants, the indentured servitude servants, the, these are both people and property, just as a wife can be both a human being and a sex object. 
and just like a waiter is both a human 